Secrets of the Lost Tomb, the cooperative pulp action adventure board game. Long subtitle, but it tells you almost everything that you need to know uh, to get a sense of what this game is about. It is a pulp, or I should say neo-pulp uh, board game, neo-pulp in that it seems to harken back more to Indiana Jones and then to the actual pulps of the 30s and the 40s, but that is the setting. Archaeologists, explorers, adventurers, uh, exploring strange locations around the world, performing unusual missions, uh, fighting against monsters, uh, surviving traps, all the good Indiana Jones stuff, with actually more than a hint of Catullian, of Catullian horror and mythology here. It's a pretty big box. Um, I discovered this game in Gen Con 2015. I was there and I saw the very impressive uh, booth of the publisher, Everything Epic. I had missed the Kickstarter, but then simply ordered a copy then because the game looked really cool. This is only the base set. There are a lot of expansions and extra sets that you get uh, if you back to the Kickstarter project and you uh, purchase some pretty high level. I guess today you can also purchase the expansion separately and the expansions may explain why this box is in fact so big because if you only have the base set like I do uh, pretty much this is all that you need everything fits in here there's nothing under these two parts here but if you had the expansions then this is where you're gonna store the expansion so there is there is a meaning that's not just there for decoration I think, and heck, everybody likes big boxes, let's face it. So, a cooperative pulp adventure board game, fully cooperative, scenario based, you choose a scenario you want to play, scenarios will create vastly different stories, and these are, in fact, stories that are, well, plot-oriented, stories that are very story-driven, uh, even more so, I would say, that uh, games in the Dungeons and Dragons board game system, like Legend of Drays or Wrath of a Shadow. The plots that emerge from the scenarios are quite detailed. Fully cooperative, which also means uh, solitaire friendly. Let me show you how the game plays. The stats and abilities of the characters in this game are indicated on this card. Each character has a different one and there is a large number of characters that you can try and they all play in quite different ways. Characters have many attributes such as strength, dexterity, knowledge, mythos, movement, Movement indicates the maximum number of rooms that you can move uh, through each time that you move. Uh, these <coughs> are stats that are used to pass tests in the specific disciplines indicated here. Characters may also have special and occasionally misspelled abilities uh, that will simply apply when the text of the ability applies. Some abilities are infinite, they're always on, like in this case, some other ones have a limited number of uses and then you will use tokens to represent the number of, uh, of uses that you still have available. Here you see on the character card the starting stats uh, in terms of audacity, health and courage. These are very important elements. And you will keep track of your stats uh, in these three departments using this player aid here which is placed on top of the character's card. So as you can see it covers the starting part that you don't need once the game starts and this uh, <clears throat> player aid here has a dial to keep track of audacity so you move it back and forth as you use spend recover audacity audacity is used to gain uh, to gain bonuses when rolling dice to uh, get uh, re-rolls Health, well, pretty self-explanatory, guess what happens when you go down to zero. And then you have Courage, which is a, well, it is an important element, because when you encounter enemies, you get so scared, but that you will lose Courage. So your Courage will go here in the negative, in the negative part of this track here will go down here and as it reaches certain areas then there will be certain effects that will apply as your courage goes down negative effects of course on the other hand there are game functions that will allow you to recover courage and when it goes up then you get positive advantages indicated again 
and this area here that is surrounded by the track. If you get all the way down to the minimum possible carriage, then it's super bad because your carter starts fleeing the tomb and it can simply leave the tomb unless you figure out a way to stop the carter. So characters have all of these stats, they also have items that may be with them at the beginning of the adventure, they may be acquired later, there may also be companions that help the characters very very Arkham Horror style in that you have many resources that will allow you to customize your character and that is great on the other hand that also means a myriad of modifiers and little abilities and exceptions and exceptions to those exceptions and special benefits that you have to keep track of well you don't have to if you don't want to use them but of course to take advantage of those you do need to remember what you have so your character is described here, but then the position of the character in the tomb is represented by a cardboard stand-up, which is, again, placed in the tomb. Uh, this is the initial configuration of the tomb. As you can see, this is a modular board, where simply as you explore the tomb, uh, will it will become larger, the tomb will become larger as you assemble the tomb from tiles coming out of this stack. The adventure starts at level 1 um, and you set up the adventure and all the parts in the game depending on the scenario that you're playing, different scenarios will tell you very different stories. This is not just a game where you go through the tomb, reach a final point, uh, find the treasure, kill the monster, whatever, and get out. As the game progresses there are triggers that are triggered by symbols that will surface from here and other game events that may happen uh, during gameplay. And when those triggers are, well, triggered, then you read the scenario instructions and they will tell you what events have been uh, caused by those triggers. That means uh, the adventure has a lot of plot points, characters that enter the board, situation that changes, because, again, uh, the board changes, interacts with you as you explore it in ways that are more complex than just uh, having new tiles coming out of this. But this is also a way in which the uh, adventure develops. That is, you explore the tomb. When it is your turn, you spend actions. Basically, there is an adventure phase where the uh, players spend actions, and each action is recorded by one of these action tokens. When you take an action, you simply flip the token to the other side and when all players have used all of their actions the adventure phase is over there's a tomb phase in which you draw a card uh, Arkham Horror style and the tomb does bad stuff to you responds monsters monsters move uh, various effects will apply but back to the adventure phase when players do perform actions again one such token is spent for each action that you take and an action can be to move from room to room up to the maximum number of rooms indicated by your movement allowance but if you enter if you discover a new area and areas with that symbol that we are told in the rules is a comet looks to me like a claw but when you see that symbol, that means that there's a door there that can be explored, so you can move in the space that is not quite there yet. But when you use movement to enter, that is to discover a new room, then you resolve the room, but then your movement is over. To resolve the room, or better, to find the room, you go through the stack of tiles. As you can see, not all tiles apply to all levels, which means that I need to go through the stack until I find a tile that has an indication for the level in which I am. I am at level 1, so I simply draw this card and I, play, I flip it face up and I place it there. On the other hand, if there that was the card on top, then I would discard it and I would keep discarding tiles until I find one with the level that I'm looking for. So you place the new card there and you resolve a possible new effects. There may be triggers that apply, there may be uh, special conditions that have to do with this new uh, room. For example here when you rest you gain extra health. Here 
from this room you can move your car to an explored explored room in the tomb by spending an action so basically this is a magic portal but you can see the symbol here that is a symbol that you need to address when you first reveal the tile uh, again certain tiles will have effects that you need to resolve immediately that symbol is called adventure symbol uh, the same here there's another symbol that is not so good which is the misadventure symbol and it is this one uh, basically when you encounter an adventure or misadventure you take a card from this deck cards in this deck are double-sided this is why either you draw from the bottom or you put this card here on top so you don't see what you got then you draw a card there and you look at adventure or misadventure side depending on uh, on the symbol that you encounter the situation that has just arisen and you simply you have a player reading the text the text will uh, give you often choices you will have to pass uh, tests uh, often and it's sort of like a mini paragraph based uh, situation here sometimes there's a mini branching tree of decisions of possible conditions you simply go through uh, the decisions and conditions that apply and you resolve the action all sort of things may happen adventure cards tend to be beneficial to you or at least uh, if you're not lucky or if you're not good enough, uh, the effects are not too dire. Misadventure is the other way around. They don't have to be terrible, but overall they are less favorable to you than adventure cards. Or I should say, the adventure side of each of these cards. That is for movement. Um, then uh, there are of course other actions that you can take during the adventure phase. Uh, suppose there are monsters, then you can choose to fight them. We'll talk about combat in a bit. There may be items or artifacts that require actions to spend them, uh, special abilities, some of them may require actions. You may rest, which allows you to recover a little bit of health or a little bit of courage or a little bit of both. Uh, here's this room here. Uh, this is called the Soulmonger. Now, when you defeat monsters, you will gain soul shards, which are a weird form of currency that then you spend when you deal with the soul monger. The soul monger reminds me of that cartoon in Resident Evil 4 that says, Hello, stranger! and sells you stuff. That guy that shows up in the craziest places at the bottom of a, of a volcano in a cursed temple where no one should be there. There's this guy that sells you stuff and this is the same thing uh, in the middle of this cursed lost tomb there is an entity that can sell you stuff or uh, sell you his services so here you have a player that tells you what the soul monger can do for you can sell you stuff or can again sell services that may allow you to regain audacity, to uh, go back to the starting health, uh, recover courage, and you have to spend soul shards to purchase the services of that guy. Also, um, you may spend an action to search a room where you are, in which case you roll a die, and then you look at one of the three columns uh, to determine the result of your search, which may be a misadventure, an adventure, spawning monsters, basic monsters, really bad monsters, finding items, finding artifacts. But which column do you, do you use? Now, this is something I really like. Each character starts... Uh, each character has a triangular token like this, which you put on the card of the card, on top of the card, with the green corner facing up. And the first time that you search, you use the green column. Right after you performed your search, you turn this, and next time that you search, you will use the yellow column. Next time, you will use the red, and so on and so forth. It's not very thematic because there's no reason whatsoever why exactly each third each third search should be much harder than than this one and why there's always this cycle uh, oh no well, it's gonna be tough now but i know next search is gonna be easy it makes thematically no sense whatsoever but it has a balancing a balancing idea behind there's a certain cadence that this brings to the game which of course simplifies gameplay or at least makes it balanced if you had a hard encounter now it is likely that the next 
uh, searches will not be as terrible. Now let's talk about stuff that you do with the dice. These dice are pretty peculiar. They are six-sided dice trapped in the body of 12-sided dice. That is, they're 12-sided dice that only have numbers from 1 to 6. The advantage is that they roll better than six-sided dice that sometimes too just tend to sit wherever they land. So there is a fun element in rolling these dice and of course demolishing the configuration of the board if you're not careful. Now these six-sided dice have numbers, guess what, from one to six with some symbols. The number one indicates a critical failure, number five is a success, and number six is a critical success. It counts as regular success for all intents and purposes unless it is in combat, then a critical success may have a special effect. Uh, in many cases, uh, you will have to take tests based on your abilities. For example, you may have strength tests, dexterity, knowledge, method tests. When you're testing one of your abilities, suppose knowledge, you grab a number of dice equal to your level uh, of ability or skill in that category, and take and you take modifiers into account: uh, items, companions, minions, curses. All sort of things may give you extra dice or remove dice. When you have your pool of dice, you roll them, and when you're, ta when you're taking a skill test, there is a target number, say it's two. The target number indicates the number of successes that you need to roll. So if I am testing for dexterity, difficulty two, I have no modifiers, I grab four dice, I roll, the difficulty is two, I need to have at least two successes, which means I need to roll at least two fives and or sixes. And in this kind of skill test, critical success or regular success, doesn't matter. Dice are also used to resolve combat. Combat is against monsters, guess what? And maybe against monsters, uh, bosses, or maybe against basic monsters or uh, epic, tougher monsters. These cards representing monsters are double-sided, so just like the adventure cards, you may want to cover them with a neutral card, or you draw from the bottom. Uh, this is also important because then the card with the stats of the creature becomes a miniature that you place on the board to indicate the position. Uh, it's not super aesthetically pleasing, but it's functional because you have all of the stats of the monster or the monster here. When you encounter a monster you lose courage because monsters are very scary. On the other hand, uh, at the end of combat, uh, if you defeat uh, the monster you recover courage, courage and you also gain soul shards. Combat is peculiar because you will only roll dice once and the same result is used to uh, the same pool of the same result of the die roll is used to determine attack and defense that is you roll dice based on your on your combat on your weapons on the modifiers minions etc etc et et and uh, you are looking again for successes for regular successes fives and for critical successes. All right. So you roll the dice, then you look at your defense, your defense level, um, which will be based on, uh, again, various factors, items, armor, da 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 and you add the number of successes that you rolled to the modifiers, defense modifiers that you may have from armor and other sources. If the combat value of the monster is higher than your total defense, again, dice plus modifiers, then you take damage and you take damage equal to the difference between the combat rating of the monster and your defense value. So you take that difference. If you took any damage, and in your pool here you have critical failures, haha, <laughs> ouchie, then uh, special abilities that the monster has will also trigger and you may get cursed, also the bad stuff may happen. Then once you determine whether you took damage or not and what kind of damage you took, you also use the same result that you rolled to determine if you were able to hit the opponent. 
Then you look at your number of successes and you inflict those as hits against the opponent. However, regular successes, that is five, can be stopped by the armor of the opponent. This opponent has zero armor, but other opponents have tough armor. So five hits, uh, successes represented by fives can be stopped. Critical successes represented by sixes cannot be stopped. So they're simply inflicted on the opponent. If you reduce the health of the opponent, this is the health to zero, then you win the combat. If the opponent took damage, but he's still there, then you use tokens to indicate the number of hits that the, that the enemy took, which also implies the number of hits that you still have to inflict. And combat simply, is a sequence of combat rounds in which you keep repeating your roll and taking and inflicting damage you roll over and over again until well either you decide to leave or one of the two parties is completely exterminated also if you have multiple players uh, multiple characters working against uh, the same enemy and minions also count as characters for this then uh, there is an advantage there's an outnumber bonus but this is Pretty much the general idea for the adventurer's turn. After the adventurer's phase of a turn, you had the tomb phase, where pretty much Arkham Horror style, you draw a card and you resolve the effects. There may be a tube effect, which is simply resolved following the text of the card. Then you move creatures, creatures that are not in the same room with playing characters, will try to reach them, they move there, there. Then you resolve combat between characters that you control and creatures that are in the rooms with them. Then you may have to spawn new creatures depending on the level in which you are. Find there is an upkeep phase. You turn the search token. Uh, the search token was the triangular token that I showed you earlier. This is also updated. And then you have the Comet Track. The Comet Track simply keeps track of the time in the tomb and the passing of time recorded by the Comet Track uh, will trigger different effects and will influence the overall structure and development of the narrative arc of the scenario. But this is, well, pretty much the general, the general idea, really. Alternate adventure phases without flexibility, where you can take a lot of different actions, resolve a lot of adventure cards, effects from everywhere, fight, use your companions, your abilities, your skills, your items, see what the dungeon, what the tomb does to you, and repeat, updating the situation based on the effects that are triggered by game conditions, see the scenario develop, see the story develop before your eyes as you alternate adventure phases and tomb phases. And you continue like this until either you are able to complete the mission of the scenario or, alas, your party is defeated by the tomb. I know, comparisons are always unfair because you're superficial and misleading, but comparisons also can help us communicate. And as I was playing this game, there were many comparisons with other games that were coming to mind, and so I'm going to use some of these to try to uh, express my ideas about the game to you. And by drawing these comparisons, I do not mean to say that the game is derivative. It simply means that it belongs to a family of games that has been successful in the last couple of years. It shows a certain family resemblance with many other examples of modern war games, uh, board games, thematic games, adventure games, and per se that is not a bad thing at all. It is all about the way that you uh, reinvent the recipe rather than finding completely new ingredients every time. Here are the ingredients, you can see where they come from, or at least you see that the games have similar ingredients. Arkham Horror is definitely a big comparison that comes to mind. I wouldn't go as far as to say that this is a re-themed Arkham Horror, the board is different, uh, uh, the combat system works differently, uh, but there definitely is a resemblance there to me uh, with the theme, the Catullian theme is almost uh, present in Secret of the, Secrets of the Lost Tomb, but mainly because of a little bit of information overload that may come from all those small cards with a lot of attributes and uh, exceptions and exceptions to those exceptions and modifiers and you had to go through all of these to make sure you had the right number of dice, you had the right number of points for this or that thing. Um, 
this is a price that you have to pay for games that are highly thematic and highly detailed and where you have a lot of possibilities, you can use a lot of weapons, work with a lot of confederates and things like that. There is not much of a way around that. The more theme you have, the more complexity you have, the more information you have. You have to keep track of that stuff. It requires a certain type of committed player. But since we have seen Arkham Horror being an extremely successful game in the last couple of years, uh, that means that we have gamers out there. I'm one of them, you're probably one of them. So we can play this game. Maybe just for the casual gamer, this uh, game may require a little too much um, involvement. Uh, Another comparison with Arkham Horror is that the game can last quite a bit, uh, which is not necessarily a bad thing. Just know your group, know the, know the mileage of the people you're playing it with. On the plus side, a long adventure with a branching story with uh, a lot of events in it, of course, can develop an epic quality, a very immersive and engrossing quality. All of these things are great. On the other hand, also, it requires some stamina that, again, casual gamers may not have. So this is a gamer's game, definitely. Um, not an entryway game. It's a game for your people that love theme, that love adventure, that love designs that may be a little messy, may feel a little unpolished around the edges, but that express a great narrative potential that have a strong storytelling quality. This is definitely a thematic game. If you were, we're talking about the narratologists versus ludologist uh, controversy in game culture, this is definitely a narratological game. Uh, this is also emphasized by the fact that there's a lot of information in the components of the game. Uh, there's a lot of information in the rulebook, and the rulebook does not do the best job possible in um, laying uh, laying out the information. Information is scattered here and there. Sometimes there are things that are underexplained that the designers seem to take for granted. That you can see they were clear in their head, but not so clear on paper. Uh, I've read on Board Game Geek that they're coming up with a new rule book with uh, rather than explanations and FAQs. That stuff can be useful, uh, but as is. The game is a little messy and the rules have gray areas here and there. But as it is actually, I, I felt that the game uh, has enough thematic interest uh, that I was able to overlook some of the minor or semi-minor questions that I had. At a certain point, I stopped worrying and I simply um, made judgment calls here and there and I assumed that a certain thing would work this way or that way. I may have made mistakes along the way, I may have played a variant of the game without being completely aware uh, that I was. But but the game worked and the story held together well. Uh, frankly, I think that this is most important with a game of this kind. With this kind of attractive components, with this narrative potential, with scenarios that are so detailed and plots that are more refined than many plots I've seen in other scenario books. So to me, that is the major thing. And then if it turns out that you made a mistake with a modifier, you rolled too many dice or not enough dice, the adventure was a little too hard, a little too easy, uh, you will actually see that overall the span of the adventure, the construction of the story throughout the affordances and obstacles of the game is what really matters. So even if you played a little wrong, rule-wise, mechanic-wise, but it created a nice story, to me, I think you were still playing the game right, in the right spirit, if not necessarily uh, following all the right mechanics. So, Secrets of the Lost Tomb. It's a bit of a messy design, um, but you can see it's a labor of love. Even the parts that, again, don't feel very polished, don't feel too, quote-unquote, professional, you can see that that happened, if anything, because of an excess of enthusiasm and love. The designers clearly are desperately madly in love with this project. They put so much into it um, that there's almost an excess of warmth that emanates from the design, which may be what sometimes makes the design a little blurred here and there. But it works, it's an enjoyable design, not for everybody, it takes time, it takes commitment to play. Um, and more than really a an experiment in ludology, 
this is a narrative engine. This is a game with a very strong narrative potential. They can tell you fun story, stories that you can enjoy by yourself in a solitaire form. The, the game is perfectly friendly to solitaire players. Can be explored with the theme of players, so then the interaction becomes interesting as players will negotiate actions uh, and will try to combine their skills and use their specializations, converge together to take advantage of numbering situations in which they have numbered the opponents and they can recover courage. A lot of these very interesting dynamic elements where theme theme is king or the whole pharaoh is the pharaoh of the, of the game so secrets of the lost tomb not a perfect game not the most elegant game but definitely a fun and engrossing narrative experience that you can experience through um through a board game through a board game design a board game that tells your story to me well it can be a good game if the story is interesting and fun and the stories that emanate from Secrets of the Lost Tomb are this kind. And before we forget, I want to thank some viewers of my videos that also backed my Kickstarter campaign for 2015. In this video, I want to thank Bjorn Eriksson, Hans Olav Hardang, Michel Journet, Stein Sherland, and Tony Kron. Thank you to the five of you for backing my Kickstarter campaign, and thanks to all of my viewers for watching my videos.